What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to this very special video. This time we're going to be doing the closing to Disney's Fun and Fancy Free VHS from 1997. So let's play the tape. Leave your worries behind and join us for a special behind-the-scenes story of the making of Walt Disney's merry masterpiece, Fun and Fancy Free. Now what kind of a title is that? <laughs> Walt Disney's 1947 feature, Fun and Fancy Free, is composed of multiple segments, a format called a package feature. The two stories, Mickey and the Beanstalk and Bongo, were originally developed as full-length feature films. Here's the behind-the-scenes story of how they were paired up to create a Fun and Fancy Free feature. Walt had been building and building and building on his success. Each film a stepping stone, starting with Snow White, moving on, Pinocchio, and then the incredible experiment of Fantasia, and then Dumbo, and Bambi. To keep his successful film series going, Walt Disney was constantly on the lookout for stories to bring to the screen. We were going to do Jack and the Beanstalk, only make a feature of it. Disney was certainly familiar with the classic fairy tale of Jack and the Beanstalk. He had used the well-known story as the basis for a 1922 silent cartoon produced by his Laphogram Film Company in Kansas City. Unfortunately, no prints of this film are known to exist. In 1933, he revisited the tale in Giant Land, a short with Mickey Mouse assuming the role of Jack. In 1938, Walt pitted Mickey against a giant again, this time as the brave little tailor. Everything he did in the past, he would bring up forward to the present to perfect, which he did in the case of the Jack and the Beanstalk. With his experience as an adversary to giants, Mickey was a natural for the lead in this giant new feature-length film. His co-stars would be Donald Duck and Goofy. It gave a feature film appearance to Mickey and Donald and Goofy. Now, these were worldwide stars, you know, great, great cartoon stars known everywhere, but they were known for their short subject. Mickey had finally broken into feature films in Fantasia, but it was never really considered that they would carry a feature film until this one came along. Development of Mickey and the Beanstalk as a full-length feature began on May 2nd, 1940. During that year, Walt Disney and several of his key story men developed many of the ideas that would be contained in the finished film. The growth of the beanstalk while Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are asleep. The gags at the giant's dinner table. And the role of the singing harp. At this same meeting, the suggestion was also made to use Foul Fellow and Gideon from Pinocchio as the phonies who swindle Mickey out of his cow. A wooden boy! Since they don't appear in the final version, just who does Mickey trade his cow to in exchange for magic beans? What are you mean, beans? Here is the answer, in a never-before-seen sequence developed in 1940, but dropped when the story was tightened for fun and fancy-free. Come forward, please. Your Majesty. What errand brings you here? Well, Your Honor, uh, Your Majesty... It's about this cow. For me? Oh, thank you, sir. How very generous of you. Well, I, uh... <laughs> oh, but my good man, I couldn't think of taking your cow. Such generosity must not go unrewarded. Let me see. Oh, yes, here. A family heirloom. One of the last. But really, I, uh... uh what's in it? Beans. Beans? Yes, magic beans. It has a beautiful legend. Let 
me read the legend to you. Faithful subject, good and kind, if fame and fortune thou wouldst find, O mystic spirit of ancient queens, plant with care these magic beans. Archival evidence of the early development of the feature version of Mickey and the Beanstalk ends in the summer of 1941. At the same time, work on Bongo was begun. The story was written in 1930 for Cosmopolitan magazine by novelist Sinclair Lewis. Bongo was an unusually light-hearted story to come from Lewis, who was the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. What happened was that uh, Walt suggested uh, Bongo, and we read it, and we felt that it wasn't quite suitable to us. And we wrote a little note refusing to make it and work on it. And of course, to our everlasting disgrace, it turned out to be a very cute picture. Since Bongo was a circus bear, there were early story notes suggesting that Bongo might even be a follow-up to Dumbo, using the same circus settings and some of the supporting cast, including the gossipy elephants. Early story sketches show a character design for Bongo that differs radically from the final one. The female bear who catches Bongo's eye went through similar revisions, as well as a couple of name changes, from Susie to Silver Ear to her final name, Lulu Bell. Bongo's nemesis, Lumpjaw, was always a big hulking brute, but in some early designs he wore street clothes. In these early sketches, a few extra characters were present. Bongo had a chimpanzee for a valet, first named Beverly, then Chimpy. In addition, Bongo and Chimpy had a series of comic encounters with a pair of mischievous country cousin bear cubs. A partially completed script of Bongo was delivered on Monday, December 8, 1941, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Just as Bongo and Mickey and the Beanstalk were at the height of their development, the world changed. And then along came World War II, which did several things. First, it cut off the European market, which was a big source of income for the studio. Secondly, it took a lot of the artists and drafted them, so they lost a lot of their talent. And then finally, the Disney studio was virtually commandeered during the war to produce war-related films, training films, morale-boosting films, all sorts of, of films that related in one way or another to the war effort. He had to rebuild his studio from scratch, you might say, after World War II, and it was a tough thing to do. Financially, it was tough. It was tough to get back to where he had been critically, where people were looking to him for new innovations. Walt looked back to Fantasia and the idea of combining unrelated music and story segments into a feature-length film. We had all of these shorts, some of them beautifully done, and, and so Walt started packaging them together and put it, making them feature-length. In 1946, Make Mine Music was released. It consisted of several animated segments featuring popular music of that era, provided by Nelson Eddy, Dinah Shore, Benny Goodman, and the Andrews Sisters. Here comes a cartoon movie from Walt Disney. A lot of people have been waiting for that a long, long time. With the end of the war, Walt revived Mickey and the Beanstalk for his first and most famous star and decided to pair it with Bongo. The introduction of the lovable little circus bear would make Mickey's return to the silver screen an even more sensational event. Since his debut, Mickey Mouse's voice had been provided by his creator, Walt Disney. He still speaks for me, and I still speak for him. In Steamboat Willie, in addition to speaking for Mickey, I also supplied a few sound effects for Minnie, his girlfriend. Here, in a recently discovered rare film clip, Walt Disney performs as Mickey Mouse with Billy Bletcher in a recording session for Mr. Mouse Takes a Trip. Oh, it's you. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's me, I guess. <laughs> All alone, without your dog. Yeah, <laughs> All alone. <laughs> you know, I used to have a little cat once. And when it was left all alone, it'd cry. <laughs> Meow. 
Walt had recorded Mickey's voice for Mickey and the Beanstalk in the spring and summer of 1941. This film would be the last time that Walt would regularly provide Mickey's voice. Jiminy Cricket, the popular supporting character from Pinocchio, was recruited to set the light-hearted tone for fun and fancy free. Jay Cricket, you can call me Jiminy. Oops. Sorry. And if there was ever a happy-go-lucky cricket, it's Jiminy. And because the theme of our show is on the lighter side, we're going to let him be our guide and narrator. Giving voice to Jiminy was his original voice, Cliff Edwards. They called him ukulele eye. And he was big. He had just a nice voice, unusual voice. It had a great range from high falsetto down to lower register. I'm a happy-go-lucky fellow. Full of fun and fancy free. And you can make the whole world seem mellow. If you take it in your stride like me. Don't cross a bridge or peep around the corner until you're there. Just learn to smile and in a while you'll find trouble is a bubble of air. Get a happy-go-lucky feeling. Keep it and I guarantee that you find you wind up living in the sun full of fun and fancy free. This sprightly song, I'm a Happy-Go-Lucky Fellow, which opens Fun and Fancy Free, had actually been written for, but dropped from Pinocchio nearly a decade earlier. I have to say a word about Billy Gilbert, who does the voice of Willie the Giant. I could change myself into the darkest things. A delightful guy whose shtick was a comic sneeze. Because he was so well known for this sneezing routine, when they auditioned voices for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he was the obvious choice to do the voice of Sneezy. <laughs> You're Sneezy! <laughs> when they recorded the voice of Willie uh, for Mickey and the Beanstalk, they thought of him again. What follows, presented publicly for the first time, is Billy Gilbert's original test recording for the role of Willie the Giant. That's it! But look, I want to be a Easter bunny with pink ears, pink eyes, and pink feet, and a pink Pink, uh, I want a pink, pink. You sure you don't want a pink bunny? A human host was chosen to tell the story of Mickey and the Beanstalk. Ventriloquist Edgar Bergen. Edgar Bergen? <laughs> Never heard of him. Edgar Bergen, who is best known today for being Candace Bergen's father, was at that time a hugely popular star of radio, who had also been in a number of movies. And he achieved the incredible feat of becoming a star on radio as a ventriloquist. And Charlie and Mortimer seemed as real as any characters that anyone else could have brought to life. He just wanted someone to sing him to sleep. Well, why didn't he turn on the radio? Well, they didn't have radios in those days. Yeah, that's why they called it Happy Valley. <laughs> Bergen and Walt Disney were longtime friends. Walt had even featured Bergen's Charlie McCarthy in several short cartoons. What a beautiful sunrise. Aaron, your nose. Go, go. Oh, hum. In 1950, Bergen would also be a guest on Disney's very first television program. Uh, Mr. Bergen, is there anything you would like to see in the Magic Mirror? Co-starring in the live-action segments was child actor Luanna Patton. Walt was also starting to build a kind of a repertory company as he moved into live-action. And the first young stars he had were Bobby Driscoll and Luanna Patton, who he had found for Song of the South. Telling the story of Bongo was Dinah Shore. Oh, a musical story sung by Dinah Shore. Well, what are we waiting for? Dinah Shore was a very popular singer at the time, uh, had hit records, and also was a, featured on her own weekly radio show, soon to be a television show. So having her name as the singer-narrator of Bongo uh, was a real asset to the film. This is still the place for a fellow like me. Just lazy and loafing and fancy free. Fun and Fancy Free premiered on September 27, 1947. Package films like Fun and Fancy Free kept the Disney magic alive in the eyes of movie audiences. And with these films, the Disney studio built up its creative strength to produce a whole new series of feature animation successes. For war-weary audiences, Fun and Fancy Free was a refreshing tonic, a tuneful and carefree jaunt with friendly and familiar characters under the guiding hand of favorite storyteller Walt Disney. The same holds true today. It's just an entertaining film that's really well done. That you find you wind 